Anziflex Barcelona revolution has begun, but just how much of a revolution is it? Barca's preseason was just four games, featuring mostly younger players, but despite that we got a glimpse of the interesting tactical direction Flick is taking this team. Today I've broken that down into five major trends we've seen so far, things that separate these performances from what we saw under Xavi, so if that sounds good, stick around, leave a like if you enjoy, and let's get into it. When Flick was announced, we all expected him to carry a lot of principles from his Bayern Munich team over to Barcelona, and so far, that's exactly what's happened. The shape he's been using in preseason is very reminiscent of Bayern, and in all three games we've seen a four at the back with wide fullbacks, a double pivot that moves a lot throughout different phases, and then a very mobile front four with wingers often coming inside. However, as we discussed in my video on Bayern's tactics, this shape is very flexible, much more so than that of Xavi's Barcelona, which by the end became incredibly rigid. We'd see the same shape consistently throughout games, which made Barca's build up quite predictable. So the first thing that sets Flick apart, and the first trend on this list, is more positional flexibility. So to give a few examples, Flick's Barca have built up with a flat double pivot, but often one of them will drop between the centre backs to create a back three, and even more often, one will push up between the lines, creating more of a classic Barcelona midfield with a single pivot. And this has created a variety in build-up that keeps the opponent's midfielders on their toes, as you've got to make new decisions about which players you're pressurising all the time. Of course, this also changes the demands of the players within the system. For example, when you're playing in that double pivot, you're not just a deep playmaker, you're often going to be more of an interior between the lines, which has largely been the role of Marc Casado, who's performed well across different areas of the pitch. And then of course, the first midfielder has to take on more responsibility as a single pivot, something we've seen young Marc Bernal do very competently in pre-season, showing good positioning and a willingness to regress the ball under pressure. Regardless of the personnel, this positional flexibility means there is absolutely no room for quote unquote system players. You've got to be smart enough and good enough to operate in different areas and more novel situations. So I'm looking forward to seeing the likes of Pedri, De Jong and Gabi in these roles, of course if they ever actually see the light of day again. So positional flexibility, the first major trend we're seeing under Flick. The second trend follows a similar theme, because with looser positioning, there's more chances to interchange with teammates and create space, or simply put, more dynamism. Ironically, this is really what typified Xavi's Barcelona initially. We saw a big emphasis on rotation to create problems for defenders, but again, this became less regular as the shape became more rigid. And even though it's early days, there's promising signs that this movement is returning under Flick. Just simple things like a winger coming inside to create space outside, or a counter movement in midfield, one coming deep, one recognising the space, these are good signs. And because of the more fluid shape overall, we're likely to see even more opportunities for this, with players doing a lot of passing and moving, interchanging, dummy running, etc. Personally, I think this makes for a more fun watch overall, so look forward to a very dynamic Barcelona in the upcoming season. The third trend we've seen is sort of a consequence of the first two and could actually define the style of play that Flix Barcelona become known for. Because with a more fluid shape and with greater range of movement, we've started to see a lot of central overloads appear and that is the third trend on this list. This example is pretty extreme with both wingers, the 10, one of the pivots and the center forwards all coming inside. But even when it's only three to four players, We've seen a big emphasis on creating numerical overloads and finding free players between the lines. This is again quite different to Xavi's team, who pretty religiously occupied those five vertical channels, and while they did look to thread balls between the lines, the main attacking route was often out wide to wingers that were hugging the touch lines. This is the major difference I was alluding to in the last installment of this series. As many of you answered correctly, Xavi's wingers always stayed high and wide, right up on the last line of defence, meanwhile Flick prefers them to drift inside. When you add the presence of a 10 or an 8, you start to encourage much more of these central passes, and we've already seen several occasions where Barca use these overloads to cut straight through the middle of the pitch. This is promising because 1 it again makes the team less predictable, but 2 if you can cut through the middle you create much more immediate danger. As I'm sure many of you know, central areas are statistically more productive than wide ones, 
yet we rarely saw these kind of combinations under Xavi. This is also going to change the types of forwards Flick will be utilising. Xavi was pretty heavily reliant on 1v1 wingers to make use of the space out wide, but for Flick, it's the fullbacks that need to be productive in those areas, and centrally, he'll need decisive players around the box, which does help explain the signing of Dani Olmo. However, chance creation is always a double-edged sword, because we can't talk about offensive positioning without its effects on defending, and this fourth trend should be of real interest to Barcelona fans, who last season saw their team concede a lot of goals. So this should really come as no surprise, German managers are usually associated with counter pressing or gegen pressing. However, this is a good time to say that Hansi Flick was always going to prioritise chance creation over everything else. His two seasons at Bayern were exemplified by high XG, both for and against, at least as far as league winners are concerned. In fact, in his only full season at Bayern, his side scored 99 goals, which is a lot but they conceded more goals per game than any other league winner since 1997-98, and that includes all of Europe's top five leagues. And so yes, these vertical central combinations will create a lot of threat, but if you lose it in this kind of area, you've got problems with only two or three players sometimes behind the ball. We have seen a couple of examples in pre-season when the ball is lost around the pivot, you can quickly get into trouble. The same is true of the way Flick wants to attack the box, doing so quickly and with a lot of numbers, which can isolate defensive players in transition. However, these examples I've shown are extreme ones, and there's a lot of different factors that go into mitigating these problems. For example, ensuring quality passes between the lines, good defensive positioning and the ability to win duels, and of course the ability of the defenders to deal with a lot of space. But the thing that the coach can impact the most is probably the mentality when it comes to counter-pressing, so conditioning the players to respond proactively when you lose it. And in that regard, there have been some early positive signs, with Casado again impressing with his ability to recover. Putting somebody like Gabi in this role would be even more effective. What's certain though is that these defensive recoveries do require a lot of energy and hard work. And that takes us perfectly onto the fifth and final trend, which is energy and hard work. It's unlikely that Flick will massively change Barca's approach out of possession. Xavi was already very demanding off the ball, wanted his team to apply near constant pressure, and took a lot of risks, like a high line, to compress the space as much as possible. So what's been interesting about this preseason is that, if anything, we've seen a more flexible approach from Flick. And across the three games, we have seen varying levels of aggression. Against Man City, for example, Barcelona prioritised compactness, using the forwards and wide players to shut down passing lanes rather than step out and to apply pressure, and that lack of engagement meant the team had to defend deeper than you might expect. But then against Milan, they still started from a compact block, still shut down the passing lanes, but were much more proactive in stepping out to apply pressure, using the sideways and backwards passes as a trigger to go from a zonal shape to a man-oriented press. This was to protect the much higher line that Barcelona tried to maintain throughout that game. Now, generally speaking, I do expect Flick to prefer this more aggressive approach, especially against weaker opposition, but it is important to note that that has significant impact on which players are actually suitable. For example, in that Milan game, Gundogan played as the 10, and although he's very intelligent and very high output, you do lose that raw energy to stay with runners, and he's not the greatest ball winner, which can become pretty costly once you start to become more man-oriented. I have the same concern in midfield for someone like Pedri, who is probably underrated when it comes to duels, but it's the ground coverage to get there that might be the issue, especially if Barca are still very vertical and give their opponent a decent chunk of the ball. It's likely that Flick, just as Xavi did, will favour those players that can give that relentless energy. It's really what paved the way for Gabi to become so important, and it could be a deciding factor in who gets prominence this season. But generally speaking, these defensive nuances are pretty hard to speculate on, so we'll just have to wait and see. So with that, we come to the end. You should now have a pretty good overview of what Flick wants to achieve at Barcelona. There is one more video I had planned for this series where I discuss the Barcelona squad and see where the strengths and weaknesses lie in relation to this system. So if you do want to see that, make sure you drop a like. Otherwise, I'll be over on Patreon with another bonus podcast. I'll be talking specifically about the youngsters we saw in preseason, who I think has a good chance of breaking into the first team and who might get left behind. So check that out if you're interested. 
you can consider it a kind of preview to the final video here in this series. Thanks as always to my members, you're amazing, and I'll see you all again next time. Take care.